Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing in St. James's Park, SW1, 300 feet south of the RVC Club where Sarah Gibson was murdered, and we're within sight of the bed where her torture took place. St. James's Park is a 23 hectare Grade 1 listed park in Westminster. Circled by such famous sites as Buckingham Palace, Horse Guards Parade, 10 Downing Street and St. James's Palace. Named after St. James the Less, a former leper hospital stood on this site. And whereas once it was home to Henry VIII's exotic zoo full of kidnapped wildlife, such as camels, elephants and crocodiles, it is now a public park. Open to everyone, it features ornate rockeries, cultivated hedges, water fountains and a duck island. Complete with a hint at its former inmates, a squadron of pelicans. For thousands of people every day, St. James's Park is an escape to the country in the heart of the city. Sadly, as the sun blazes, its peace is often pulverized by a plethora of prized pillocks. Whether posh brats banging on bongos, as if playing ethnic instruments makes their daddy's asset-stripping income less racist. The pungent whiff of the shit Santa, who decorates trees with little bags of poodle plop. Those talentless circus turds, who tippy-toe a tightrope between trees a full three inches off the grass and the worst terrorist to tranquility, children. Ugh, please, somebody tell them to shut up. But at night, as the park empties, it becomes a refuge for the city's homeless. And although it's a public park for everyone to enjoy, just like the RAC Club, there are laws over who is welcome and who isn't. On the night of Sunday the 2nd of July 1972, just hours before her four-hour torture, the killer of Sarah Gibson stood in this park, barely 300 feet from her bed in room 519. His name was David Frooms. But how did they meet and why did he kill her? Was it personal, revenge, a mistake? or a series of unfortunate coincidences. My name is Michael, I'm your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 160, Do Not Disturb, Part 2. On Monday the 3rd of July 1972, at 12pm, in Westminster Public Mortuary, Home Office Pathologist Professor Keith Simpson conducted a post-mortem on 21-year-old Sarah Gibson. Present was the investigating officer, Detective Chief Inspector James Neville, and the exhibits officer, Sergeant Brian Vickery. Found at 9.25am, with her multicolored blanket pulled up to her nose, she looked as if she was asleep. Her room was as she had left it the night before. Door ajar, light and TV on, and a half-drunk cup of coffee on the floor. But as her bedclothes were pulled down to her ankles, her injuries told a different story. Lying perfectly straight, Sarah had been stripped naked from the neck down. Her ripped white knickers lay crumpled beside her bloated face. Her blue bed jacket had been violently torn open at all but one last loop, and splayed across her shoulders lay the tattered remains of her orange nylon nightdress. Her pale flesh, her small breasts, and her gaping vagina 
had been laid bare to the sadist before her. Given the attack, several injuries were as expected. She had a half-inch split to her tongue's tip, caused by the stifling force of a makeshift gag made from a handkerchief and some torn toweling. Gagged to keep her quiet, this had left a ring of linear pressure marks from her mouth sides to her skull's base. Across her wrists and ankles were faint lacerations, having been tied using her own white stockings. And four inches to the left of her midneck lay a pull impression suffused with minute hemorrhages, as her garrote-toting killer had strangled every ounce of energy and every last breath out of her body. With her last seen alive at 9.45pm and her death estimated at roughly 4am, although Sarah was only small, her injuries were inflicted by someone stronger than herself, but not by much. But what most perplexed the pathologist was the injuries he didn't see. Sarah had been strangled, and as she'd fought for her life, her fingernails had clawed her neck. But her hyoid bone had not been fractured, and he had expected to see more bruising or greater signs of a struggle. Instead, there was very little, except for a missing earring and two lost curlers. So what was this? A crazy sadist or a sex game gone bad? During the night, Sarah's restraints were cut and then retied at the wrists and ankles with a soft woolen cord from her blue bathrobe, which left only faint flushing that the pathologist almost didn't spot. The gag in her mouth had been loosened and a soft pillow was placed under her backside. But why? Nothing about the scene made sense. Her bedroom didn't look ransacked, to the point where even her half-drunk cup, the jar of instant coffee, and a pot of powdered milk lay opened and undisturbed on the floor beside her bed. And yet her death was violent, with several inexpensive items now missing. A bloodied blanket, a sweat-soaked bedsheet, cut restraints, and a torturously slow strangulation told a tale of a terrifying assault on a defenseless young girl in her own bed. But was this inflicted by someone who loved her, hated her, or both? There was no denying that a sexual sadist had done this as although no sexual injuries were found, a glutinous matter later identified as semen seeped from her vulva. And with no tearing found within, the pathologist concluded intercourse had taken place either before, during, or after her death. But who was David Froome's? How did he know Sarah? And why did he want her dead? David Charles Richard Frooms, known as Dave, was born on the 22nd of April 1947 at Perivale Maternity Hospital in Greenford, West London. And what followed was a childhood as broken as it was tough. Being a baby in a crib was the only time that his life had stability. Age two, his parents separated, his father vanished, and seeking to absolve herself of her burden, his mother sent this unwanted boy to live with her grandmother in Southall. Age five, his grandmother died, and with no one willing to foster this bright but restless boy, he was bounced back to his reluctant mother, a stepfather he despised, and two stepsisters. One called Liz, who he liked, but was plagued by depression and blindness, and a younger one he disliked, called Leslie. Age seven, 
having repeatedly run away from home and stealing to support his life on the streets. Both David and Liz were ripped from their lives and sent to St. Vincent's, a Catholic-run children's home in Feltham, where they lived without love for the next three years. Developing a deep distrust of others, David found it difficult to form friendships, to make any future plans, and he always felt isolated. Age 10, the home bounced him back to the unwelcome arms of a mother and a stepfather, who lived in a cramped little caravan at Wingfield in Surrey. Promptly sent to a court-appointed approved school for training and re-education, Although many young boys saw Borstal as a place of unspeakable horror, David found a semblance of stability among its dark, cold walls, but became institutionalized. In stark contrast, Sarah was raised 62 miles west in the wealthy and privileged horse racing village of Lambourne in Berkshire. And so far, fate had yet to force their paths to cross. But it would. Like Sarah, physically, David was unremarkable. Being just three inches taller, but roughly the same weight, he was intensely pale, with a thin bespectacled face and long dark hair. Like her, he was pleasant, quiet and polite, but kept his distance. He spoke with a firm, whispering tone, which many struggled to hear, and he was smart and literate, which was amazing given how fractured his education was. So had they met in childhood, maybe Sarah and David would have become kindred spirits. But they didn't. As with his first decade of life, his second would be even more troubling and traumatic. Aged 11, as a young boy sleeping rough in a tent by a riverbank in Windsor, a lone man approached him, befriended him, and asked David to masturbate him. Terrified, David hit him with a torch, but this first sexual experience imprinted four key words on his damaged psyche. Sex. Sex. Panic, attack, and run. That same year, having stolen money and food to fund his life on the streets, his mother packed him off to live with the absentee father he barely knew in Southall. Unhappy, he repeatedly played truant, and with neither parent wanting him, David was sent to Denham Court Children's Home for two years. Aged 12 to 15, David was a resident at the Shashila Community Home in Blandford, Dorset, an experimental care home where the kids could run riot. He later said, We could do whatever we wanted. Smash windows, cause havoc, steal. All to get it out of our system. But being unable to tolerate his behaviour, David was expelled from yet another possible place he could have called home. As David would later state, although restless, I was often at my happiest when I was confined to prison. In April 1962, age 14, he was given a 12-month conditional discharge for stealing a car and was sent to Haim Romand home for six months. December 1962 at Kingston, he was sent to Red Hill Approved School for stealing a car, only to abscond and be re-arrested. March 1963, at Grays, he stole a car, nine pence from a phone box, and was sent to Borstal at Felton. Released on the 18th of May 1965, he got work as a trainee carpenter at Russell Brothers The Builders on Harrow Road, but quit after one and a half days. As criminal careers go, he primarily stole from cars whilst living destitute. 
there was nothing sexual, violent, or sadistic. In 1965, aged 18, lodging in a halfway house in Weymouth, the landlord made sexual advances upon him. David asked to be moved, but the probation officer insisted that he finish a week's work first. To achieve this unmolested, every night David hid under his bed, pretending he was out. Falling back on old habits, he decided to flee, and to fund this, he burgled the landlord's flat. This should have been a simple job, but when the landlord returned early, gripping a thick stick and swinging it so wildly it left the landlord blind, four key words flooded back into David's damaged psyche: sex, sex panic, panic, attack, attack and run. run. For robbery with violent assault, he was sent to Brixton Prison for three years and six months. With the theft of food and money being his primary motive, the burglary of houses had also become part of his criminal repertoire. For David, it was a low-risk crime, in which he never confronted the owners. He later said. I chose homes with a light on upstairs, because I knew the doors will always be open. As a secret was to enter and exit as quietly as possible. But then again, one particular conviction stands out as sinister. In May 1969, in the coastal town of Ramsgate, 22-year-old David. Got talking to an attractive thirteen-year-old girl, who was out walking a dog. It was a pretty good feat for me to start talking like that. They chatted, went to a park, and feeling increasingly randy, I touched her breasts and private parts. David was arrested minutes later and served one year in Pentonville Prison. Six months for a prior burglary, three months for car theft, and shockingly, just three months for the indecent assault of a child. Up until his arrest for Sarah's murder, he had no other criminal convictions for sexual offences. Those who knew him said he was not that not way that inclined. Way inclined. And having interviewed a few of his sexual partners. He had no interest in bondage or strangulation. If anything, he was caring, loving, and thoughtful. For his tenth conviction for burglary, car theft, and trespassing, on the twenty-second of September, nineteen seventy, in Dorset, David was sentenced to two years at Grendon Underwood Psychiatric Prison in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire. Given psychotherapy. David was later diagnosed with a severe personality disorder, characterized by feelings of inadequacy, difficulty undertaking ordinary tasks when outside of institutions, and he panics in psychologically and sexually threatening situations, in which he often acts impulsively and violently. Inside, even David admitted. I had matured to some extent. I began to question my motives. But having been released early for good behaviour, his support stopped, and all of the hard work was undone. On the twenty-third of January, nineteen seventy-two, six months before Sarah's murder, David was released from prison. But there was one glimmer of hope in David's tragic little life: the Simonwell Community Trust. Based out of a disused 400-room school at Simonwell Farm near Grundell in Canterbury, this was a charity 
which drew attention to the thousands of homeless people living on the welfare state. Working for £1.50p a week, plus food and board, he described it as a happy spirit of comradeship, where he helped with the repairs, manned the phones, organised jumble sales and scrubbed the floors. Having met the charity, age 14, over his decade of incarceration, instead of being bounced from romance centres into a hodgepodge of unfamiliar halfway houses, this had become his surrogate home. It provided him with a routine, stability, and although still a prolific thief, any future offences were few and far between. The last time I was at Simon, I stayed out of trouble for six months. It's the best I've ever done. Here he strived to be a good person, and through hard work, he flourished. Trying his best to build bridges with his fractured family, David sent his mum, sister and grandparents several letters apologising for his behaviour and reassuring them he was desperate to live a better life. Dear Mum, this will probably come as a surprise, my writing out of the blue. I was a bit wary of writing to you, as once again I've been in trouble, and I wasn't sure how you would take it. At the moment, I'm trying to rejoin the Simon community. It's a purely voluntary body, most of their workers are students who intend to go into social work, so it means working with people who actually care. And although he infrequently got replies, he wrote as often as he could with updates on his plans. Such as his routine. I'm kept very busy at the moment, what with 400 rooms to clean, which were left in a terrible state when vandals broke in. His new pal. I've acquired a dog called Rebel. He's a little neurotic, but very affectionate. His new hobbies. Liz bought me a guitar. I can play a few simple songs, such as On Top of Old Smokey and Tom Dooley, but nothing too complicated. I still do some drawing now and then, and also attempt to write poetry. And then, of course, he spoke of his love life. Dear Mum, I wonder if you can help me. There's this girl called Anne, whom I'm very fond of and who was sort of keeping an eye on me for about four years now. Last week, she had an accident up in Nottingham. I want very much to see her. Do you think you could spare me a few quid? I hate to ask, but she really is the only girl I've ever felt anything for, and I don't like the idea of her being up there all alone. I'm sorry I ask you for things all the time, but... She really does mean a lot to me. Maybe you'll meet her sometime. My love to you all. Take care. Dave. Kiss. And so, through the dark brooding clouds of his troubled past, a bright glint of sunlight shone. But a thief can't help be a thief especially when he's restless, lovesick, and ready to flee. On the 13th of June, 1972, as a trusted volunteer of the Simon Community Trust, David was given 50 pounds to buy food, a duty he had done many times before. Only this time, fueled by impulsive thoughts, he ran. Hopping on the first train out of Canterbury, 24-year-old David Frooms headed to London King's Cross, carrying little more than a backpack of tatty clothes, with no plan, no friends, and no place to stay. He didn't know London, and the city was not a safe place for a young boy on the run. On his first night, having blown eight pounds on booze, he was fleeced by two Soho sex workers. I've been drinking. I was illogical. 
One nicked 14 quid and ran. The other did the rest with a tenner for the ponce and 15 for a room. I was angry. I bought a penknife. I searched the streets shouting, If I find them, I will kill them. As four key words blasted his damaged psyche. Sex, panic, attack and run. Run. For two-thirds of his life, David had been hungry, broke, and homeless. But his past experience had taught him how to survive. By living rough, laying low, and breaking into cars and houses for food and money. On Sunday the 2nd of July 1972, The weather was hot, as Britain was in the grip of a mini heatwave. Living rough, like many of London's homeless, David made a makeshift tent in St. James's Park. A place chosen, as it was open to the public, had bushes to pitch a tent, and a nearby tap for washing and drinking. By night he slept, and by day he prowled the city streets looking for cars and homes to steal from. That Sunday, as Sarah woke late, ate toast, drank coffee, and dressed in casual clothes, David and a pal went to a pub in Victoria and were pissed by mid-afternoon. At this point, Sarah was shopping in Piccadilly, purchasing an evening standard and 20 embassies. By 5 p.m. she was finished, and by that point, David was sleeping off the booze in his tent. So far, they hadn't met, spoken, or even so much as glanced in each other's direction. At 7 p.m., Sarah dined in the staff restaurant, eating a meal of stew and dumplings. David was asleep. At 7.30pm, Sarah walked two streets north to the Fun City Bingo Hall at 3-4 Coventry Street. Sitting by herself, she bought two scorecards and a soft drink, leaving 60 pence in her purse. David was asleep. At 9.45pm, Sarah left Piccadilly and headed back to the RAC Club, a very secure private members club accessed only by staff and a select group of London's wealthiest who are vetted and approved. Woken briefly by his pal, who as a rent boy was off to earn a few pounds. Although hungry, David slept on. At 9.50pm, Sarah entered room 519 on the fifth floor in the staff-only quarters of the RAC club. She popped on the telly, possibly to cold it, and unwittingly laid out the tools of her demise. Such as the white stockings, which her killer would use to bind her wrists and ankles. The blue bathrobe, whose soft woolen cord he later used to retie them. And dressing in white knickers, a blue bed jacket, and an orange nylon nightdress. This was her usual night attire, which he would rip from her pale bare flesh. At 10.15pm, during Monty Python, she smoked, popped in her curlers, and perched her handbag on the chair, as well as a watch, a locket, and a Churchill crown, several inexpensive items which he would steal. At 10.45pm, during midweek, she made a flask of coffee, grabbed a newspaper, and having hopped into her single-sized bed, By the late news, she was snuggled up under a multicolored woolen blanket of red, black, orange and cream squares, as her sleepy head nestled softly into a thick white pillow. And as the channel closed down for the night, and the telly turned into snowy fuzz and white noise, as she often did, 
she fell asleep with the lights and TV on, her curtains half open, and her door left ajar. Being night time, David might have slept right through till sunrise. Only he didn't. I was trying to sleep in St. James's Park. The law came in and kicked everyone out. Worried they were searching for him as a felon who had stolen £50 from Simon Well Trust. As he always did, he panicked and fled. He ran up the steps of the Duke of York Memorial, into Carlton House Terrace, along Carlton Gardens, and tried to break into the offices of Wool House, but failed. I wanted somewhere to keep. At that point, David's needs were simple. Food, money, and warmth. It was just pure luck that I broke into that place. And although a skilled burglar, it was a series of unfortunate coincidences which ensured that his entry was easy and undetected. Climbing the staff only staircase to the fifth floor, as he entered the roof, he saw a small room with the light still on. As he had done many times before, I chose homes with a light on upstairs because I knew the doors would always be open. And being claustrophobic, Sarah's door was unlocked and left ajar. I went along the corridor till I came to this one where I could see the light was coming from. I opened the door and went in, very quietly. And then I saw this girl lying on the bed asleep. Sarah was an innocent with no enemies. She would be murdered in the one place she felt safest, her own bed. But it wasn't for something she had done, said or knew. David had entered with nothing on his mind but hunger and sleep. As even he would say, I broke in and one thing led to another. But until that very second, when he spied her in the doorway, Sarah and David had never met. Do Not Disturb concludes next week. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to Extra Mile. Uh, the unscripted, unedited, blah, 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 etc., etc., and all that, and all that. Hope you enjoyed that episode. As with as with every episode of Murder Mile, I always try and do something different. This time, I really wanted to do something which, because it's such a fascinating case, and it's it's never it's never been told before. Uh, you'll you'll find tiny bits and different occasionally in magazines stuff like that, but it's badly written and it's the people just haven't got the original files. Luckily, I got access to one of the police files. This has given me a real insight into everything that's going on. So everything is based on the the police investigation and all the witness statements. Um, but it's just fascinating. It's fascinating how you could have one person who you think there must be a reason why he attacked her. And there isn't. And then you look at him, which is why we're focusing on episode two. And you must think there must be a reason. He must be a sex maniac or something like that. But he's not. There's it's 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 just a, a lad who's got, he's homeless and he he spends he spent his whole life trying just trying to survive. He has a little bit in his back history, which is which is that kind of the the sexual assault. We don't know enough about that, so I'd love to know more about that. But what drove him to do what he did why did he spend four hours attacking this girl what was going on in his head so yeah that's why it's fascinating so this episode asked a lot of questions next week's episode the final episode that is all of the answers that's everything ever so i've put in a lot into these episodes it looks like there's a lot of stuff in there and you think it's un- unimportant it's not there's 
hell of a lot of really important information in there so next week we will go through it and uh luckily david did he gave some quite lengthy statements so we're going to use his statements we're going to go through all the evidence we're going to follow it step by step and we're going to see exactly what happened we're going to try and uncover as much as we can uh, just to say uh, a big thank you to all my new patron supporters thank you so much everyone uh they are pauline honigsberg claire emily nike Bagaji, I hope I got that right. Nike Bagaji, I've probably got Nike wrong. Like an idiot, I got the name wrong. It's actually Nikki, not Nike. What an idiot. <laughs> um, um, uh, Catherine Pullen, Aman- Louise Amanda, Neil Timms, Katie Hill, and Joe Wink. Thank you, guys. That's very much appreciated. Hopefully, you've got all of your goodies and they should be with you now. Uh, also, a thank you. It was my birthday a little while ago. Uh, so thank you to Lucy Barr and Alison Brown for your very kind birthday donations. I did spend it on cake. Of course I did. And I made sure that Eva didn't get to spend it on her. Uh, super strength foreign lager. You know what she's like. I mean, it makes no difference. I could, I could basically just put a bottle of vinegar in front of her with uh, gin in it and she'd be happy. Classy lady, classy lady. I'm going to make a cup of tea. Oh, dear. Right. Uh, and open some windows because this is necessary. It's a nice day out today. It looks nice. Um, water on. Uh, open some side windows. Nice sunny day. I think we deserve that after the uh, after the storms that we had. Oh, dear. Look at that. Blue skies. Lovely blue skies it's going to be nice what will i be doing i will be sitting in here doing uh, editing as always editing this together um i just had to redo some of my david voice because halfway through i changed my david voice i had him with a bit of a whisper uh and he doesn't he doesn't actually have an accent uh, it's a bit nondescript his accent because he's moved around a lot, but it just it just felt a bit better having him with a bit of a London accent. Uh, it, so that's not how he sounds, but it it just made it easier for me, so I did it that way. So there we go. Um, so if you're new to Extra Mile, I'm just making a tea, which is what I do. A coffee. I'm actually making a coffee. Uh, we're going to do a quiz in a second. We're we'll going to throw in some extra stuff about the episode, which may be of interest to you. We'll answer the questions, and uh, this is that. Uh, while this is boiling, let's do the questions. So, quiz questions. Don't forget, as always, I may ball some of these up. So, question one. What were David Froome's middle names? He had two. What were David Froome's middle names? Question two. Which part of West London was he born in? Question three. Name his two stepsisters. Question four. What was the name of the dog he adopted at Simonwell? Question five. How much money did the two sex workers fleece out of him in total? Question six. How many rooms were at the Simonwell Trust? That's the, uh, the the old school building. How many were there? Question seven. Name one of the two songs that he learned to play on the guitar. Question eight. Outside of playing guitar, what was his other hobby? Question nine. Name one of the four famous sites, as mentioned, which circle St. James's Park. There were four, you can choose one. Question 10. Who was the pathologist who performed Sarah's autopsy? Tease up. Oh. La, 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 la. There we go. Done. Coming back. Oh, God, it's cold. Cold one last night. I've currently got... As always, got my pyjamas and my bathrobe on with fingerless gloves, woolen hat on my head and uh, a hot water bottle at my feet. God, dear, it's cold. How is everyone? Did everyone everyone in the UK survive the, st- the storms? It was a bit rocky on the old boat. 
Yeah, luckily I'd pinned myself down really carefully. I got it's it's a it's uh not a hugely long boat, but it's long enough. It's about average narrow boat size, and I had six pins in there, so you have big steel pins, and you kind of if you connect them together and you kind of use them to balance off each other, it keeps the boat nice and safe. And I kept my lines tight and I kept an eye on everything. And I was meant to be away for my birthday. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't travel to my brother, so I didn't get to see my family. And the next day, I couldn't go out to the pub because everything was down. So I basically had a birthday all by myself. Oh, anyway. Uh, but on the days of the storms, I was keeping an eye out for all the neighbours because all the neighbours' boats out there. Some people on their boats, some people not. Some heavy boats, some not so heavy boats. And like there was a jump you know, on the plastic boats up there was bouncing around. So I repinned him and there was a wide beam that was kind of, connected in by two pins which is absolutely ridiculous so i repinned him and i looked out my window to the right and one of my neighbors who had it's like a almost a 70 foot boat a huge boat was blocking the whole canal and i so i went out with my hammer and, I, uh, and he was on the boat and i was like you're right it's like i need help and it's like the winds were high and he didn't have, he didn't have the proper ropes He's, he had bungee ropes which are absolutely ridiculous but anyway i was like uh, give this guy a go uh a cyclist went past with blood all over his face he'd just been hit in the face with a branch and he's like have you got some ice and i was like i have got some ice but we're gonna get this guy in first and then i'll get you some ice <laughs> so it took three of us we had to wait for wait for a moment when the wind stopped and then we just pulled in this is it's like 20 ton boat which in high winds is about you have to triple it so it felt like a 60 ton boat almost killed our arms got him repinned got this guy sorted with all the blood over his face oh what a fun day so that that was my storms day so basically just keeping an eye on uh, all the boats around here but uh, pretty much everyone survived three trees fell down near me and all of them missed boats miracle absolute miracle so um oh dear let's dive into some stuff about david's life um i'm not going to dive in too much about his background his his family history because we've kind of already done some of that uh his first offense 19th of april 1961 taking and driving away a motor car a blandford juvenile court uh 14 years old at the time he was given a conditional discharge of 12 months knowing the courts they pro they probably disqualified him from driving even though he's 14 years old i find that it's fascinating when they do that they go they go oh we're gonna ban you from driving for two years and you go but he's 14 he can't drive for another two years anyway but it's that box ticking shit isn't it where they go oh well we have to ban him from driving it's like it's irrelevant uh, he was also fined 15 shillings times two uh, after that he was sent to the orchard lodge over in teddington uh, he was only there for about two months and then he was sent to the hincham uh, remand home here he escaped from there on the 24th of november 1961 and was rearrested the next day this seems to happen a lot that um um when he gets sent to these remand homes he's he's often uh he often goes absent uh 5th of september 1961 at kingston county juvenile court again he's still a juvenile he's underage he was committed to an approved school for taking and driving away a, a motor car um this time he was sent for a whole month to the philanthropic philanthropic farm approved school in red hill in surrey again on the 23rd of june january he absconded he was arrested and returned the next day this happens a lot uh see this is why i've had to be selective on what i've put into this episode because his criminal history and his history of where he's at roman centers is huge and the way he is he's bounced all over the country in different places he's never in the same place there's just no consistency in his life um 25th of january 1963 for four months he was sent to ardell approved school where he absconded twice and committed criminal offenses while he was there 7th of march 1963 at gray's juvenile court so this is when he comes back to london he got a conditional discharge for stealing a car um while, and driving whilst disqualified and with no insurance of course he was because he was underage um and at that point he also stole some money from a telephone kiosk which i'm not going to say how much because i think that was a question or that could be wrong um fourth offense 16th of may 1963 driving again while disqualified uh again underage 12 month conditional discharge after that he was sent to feltham which was a, a which a famous 
a Young Offenders Institute, or a Borstal, as they would call it back then. He was there for just under a month. Um, when he was there, he said, do you know what? When he was inside prison, he said he got on well. He said he liked the clothes part. Inside, when he's in prison, he has to wake up at set times. He has to do set jobs. He has to go to certain places. He's restricted. He's you know, For him, the restrictions and the kind of the routine make sense. But the freedom of it, he by this point, he's only a teenager by that point, but because he's been in and out of romance centres and bounced around and, you know, his, his, his mum seems to be a, a bit wayward and doesn't really seem to give a shit. His dad doesn't give a shit. Do you know what? He did love his, um, his grandmother, his original grandmother, he absolutely loved, but she was the one who died when he was five years old. And that's kind of, you know, a key point in his life. Uh, as mentioned, he was released from prison and he did one and a half days work as a trainee carpenter. That's that's pretty much the only legitimate job he did, except for the charity work, which we get in later on. Um, the the sexual encounters uh, or the gay uh, gay assaults in his life are kind of interesting. Obviously, there's two. There's the one, the early one in Winkford when he was a child and. Uh, uh, some old pervert asked him to masturbate him. Um, this second one, uh, this is the one that he, he was sent to prison for three years and six months for. So um, after he got released from prison, there was a man who apparently was very kind to him and said, you know what, if you need a halfway house, I'll be your landlord. But this guy started making sexual advances to him. Um, David's small, he's frail, he's, you know, he's quite vulnerable. Obviously, this is why this guy's picking on him. Um... Uh, he needed a place to stay so the probation officer said okay well you can stay there while you do your work david had said this guy's this guy's making sexual advances to me i feel threatened i need to leave and the probation officer in their wisdom said no you need to stay in this ho this this house where this guy potentially could rape you yeah so uh david absolutely terrified he said he spent 10 days basically sleeping under his bed um as happens in his life i've tried to set this up in the whole episode about this is what his his life is all about it's about not dealing with problems he panics he gets upset he becomes violent uh he flees and when he flees and he goes on the run he steals in order to to fund himself so he can kind of run this is not to justify what he would later do this is to kind of ask the question question why is it that he can be this person who's kind of about survival and then he does that. He does what he does to Sarah. This is what the episode is about. It's, it's, there's, it's two separate people going on there. And I don't know, I don't know how they connect. And I think, I think these, I think the abandonment, I think these, these uh, attacks in his life, I think there's something going on there in his, in him where uh, something may have happened that night. Maybe, who knows, maybe Sarah was, maybe one of, one of the staff came past the door was open maybe maybe sarah made a sound maybe that's why he murdered her maybe it's something as simple as that we don't know <sighs> but we'll dive into that next week that's what next week is all about um so yeah uh, uh this landlord we don't really know much about it we know that it was in weymouth we know that he stole roughly 40 pounds from the man's wallet we know that they said it was a wooden ruler but other accounts have said it was a stick but he beat the man over the head until he became unconscious um the man lost his speech owing to head injuries and some of his eyesight as well whether that was regained we don't know uh, interestingly nothing happened to the landlord the landlord was not charged with uh, any sexual offenses interesting uh so for that uh david was sent to the central criminal court the old bailey on the 23rd of july 1965 he was sentenced to three years in prison and six months to be served concurrently for vi a robbery with violence theft of a motor vehicle uh he, he'd done a lot by that point there was 13 cases considered uh and the theft of uh property worth 50 pounds in total uh interesting going through his history it's, it's interesting how his thought process as a burglar do you know i would have thought as a burglar you would you would want to go into a building where the lights are off do you know if you know how to break in you go well no one's in there i can break in but his thought process is kind of interesting how it's like if he sees someone is upstairs in their bedroom he knows that the doors downstairs will be open the alarm will be off probably the back door will be open probably windows will be open it'll be easy to get in 
he can go in and help himself and be out quickly. He doesn't confront people. He's little. Uh, that's not his thing. Actually, most burglars, as we've mentioned in the stockbroker episode, most you have different types of burglars, and very few of them actually want to confront you. Basically, they they're frightened. They want to get in and get out as quick as possible. Uh, and David is one of those people. He's not a confronter. Um, uh, 26th of May 1965, he committed a robbery in Battersea. Uh, he was in prison until the 17th of September 1964 when he escaped from prison. Uh, again, he was rearrested the next day. Um, now, 1962, when he was 14, he'd been introduced to the Simon Well Community Trust, which is the charity organisation. He'd met actually met them in Liverpool. Uh, but it was around this time that they were setting up Simon Well Farm over on Soul Street uh, near Grumdale in Canterbury. Uh, seems like a fantastic kind of charity. You know, lots of people. Are, there's a real kind of a love online for people who've kind of uh, uh, been through the system because it was very kind of progressive and all about kind of giving people a kind of a bond and a routine and uh, pushing forward. In fact, um looking into his history his first uh sexual encounters in a kind of a positive way were with uh he says four different girls when he was working at simon well uh he had sexual partners but he said he always found it difficult to create a kind of a close emotional bond as you can appreciate he hasn't had a good uh hasn't had a good history with people in his past people have been actually quite shit to him so uh trusting people he finds really difficult but as we can see with the kind of the, the the girlfriend called Anne who he was kind of very interested in um he wants he wants to find love he wants an emotional bond but he's just really struggling with it our uh, sixth offense over at Blandford uh, February 1968 stealing from a dwelling house so he's he's progressed very much into burglary at this point still taking uh stealing from cars and stealing cars as well six months in prison suspended for three years uh two lots of three months of imprisonment uh, uh suspended for three years as well again he said he got on well in prison uh let's just see what else i want to go, get into some of these letters that he was oh okay the uh the sexual assault on the girl 9th of august uh 1968 hastings quarter sessions uh now he was charged then for theft from a dwelling house uh taking a motor vehicle um of course he was still on probation for uh burglary and car theft uh indecent assault of a girl aged 13 years old uh, accosted in a wood a wooded area uh, he was released 17th of february 1969 having spent one year in prison as mentioned he only served three months for the indecent assault of the girl which was exactly the same as he was charged for driving without insurance absolutely baffling uh we don't know where this is we don't know the girl's name obviously she's 13 years old uh this was over near ramsgate she she was out walking her dog um we don't know anything much about it literally i, I managed to find an article about it uh, most of this is based on uh, his criminal record and his statements about it later on because obviously when he went to prison uh, they did a series of uh, psychological uh, assessments on him which we will dive into uh, hopefully in the next episode um simon well was good for him he really enjoyed it uh, when he was released after that sentence he was sent down to brighton he was working again in a hostel for the homeless uh, this was the hasting branch of the simon community trust they've got places all over the country he really enjoyed it there he was doing jumble sales and distributing leaflets and this is the point where he's kind of he's he's starting to do quite well um he's making new friends he said there were lots of university students who were doing social work course and you know, he really got on well with them uh he was invited to a party but the problem is he didn't have any money so he reverted to type and he broke into a house and he stole a record player. Um, so again, he was sent back to prison, uh, arrested for burglary. This time, 10 cases of burglary. Uh, uh, one case where he forced a wooden panel on a flat door using a knife, uh, using a kitchen knife. Now, often he, d he doesn't really carry weapons with him. Um, it's still uncertain whether he carried a knife with him when he attacked sarah uh, he definitely uh, either he definitely tore and cut some of her clothes it's it is suggested that he he's he had his pen knife with him the one that mentioned 
Uh, we mentioned when uh, he went in search of the sex workers who kind of diddled him out of some money, uh, but we don't know whether he used that knife when he was with uh, Sarah. He certainly didn't uh, uh, attempt to cut her up or mutilate her in any way. Ah, uh, what else we got? Tenth offence. So we briefly mentioned on this. Twenty uh, second of September, nineteen seventy, Dorset Quarter Sessions. He was sentenced to two years at Grendon Underwood Psychiatric Prison in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, uh, for burglary, theft of a motor vehicle, driving in a dangerous manner, and trespassing. There's quite a few of these driving in a dangerous manner things, and I. I put it into the episode originally, but then I took it out uh, because it just throws things off. But um, the reason that driving for, in a dangerous manner is when he sees the police and he's in a stolen car, he does what he always does. He panics and he flees. Uh, so there's quite a few cases of that that crops up, um, which is which is which leads to the point where he's in St. James's Park and he sees all the police kind of going through all the tents. And even he would say, I I didn't know whether they were just wanted people booted out or whether they were coming after him because he'd stolen that 50 quid uh, and he thought they might be after him. It seems unlikely, but that's that's kind of the way his brain thinks. You know, the world is against him. Um, Grendon, uh, Underwood Psychiatric Prison, a forward-thinking prison. Um, when he was there, obviously he was doing a lot of um, uh, ca- like group counselling and he was, you know, had access to a, a, a psych therapist when he was there sorry i got hiccups um bro well, um they looked at him they looked at his past they felt that uh, he really needed a good amount of time uh in total he was with the psychotherapist for about 8 months in total uh, in t- uh, the doctor himself said given david's back history he needs a, he needs to be with us for at least 2 years unfortunately uh, he was released early because of good behaviour, uh, and that was the end of it. That was the end of any kind of counselling that was going on. Even the doctors were saying, he needs to stay here, or we need to continue with this somewhere else. But there was no money for it, there was no opportunity, therefore he was released into the community. Um, which is when he went back to uh, Simonwell. Uh, the place that he liked. And again, when you look at him here, he's done th- he's done six months. He really enjoys it. It's a place that he really likes. He's uh, They trust him. They give him money. He's got good jobs. Um, let's dive into one of these letters. that he'd, This These were in the police files. He sent a series of letters to his mum. So this was during his release from prison. And you can see that he's trying to make steps. He sends letters to his mum, his sister, his sister who's going blind, his, uh, his, his uh, other grandparents. I think there might be one to his dad as well, but I'm not too sure. Um, but I wrote down some of them, and they're really. F- I, let's, I'm not going to read them out full. Let's see if. Uh, do I have the. No, I didn't put them in. What an idiot. Uh, so th- this is kind of interesting. He's he's sending letters back and forth. Um, he's when he's there. He's he, he he's clear it's clear that he's really getting on with the uh the simon world trust when he's there he's liking it he's working really hard uh he's he's working the night shift on the phones let me just try and go down a bit and just see if i i don't have uh because it is interesting it is interesting he says he says it's interesting it might not be interesting you might be uh you might listen to it and go good boring that was boring why did he go to that bit but i just i just find things that people say interesting uh this is next week's leper let leper letter hang on uh letter two life at simon well oh michael what did you do with it i don't know Anyway, I could do it off the top of my head. Uh, so it went really well when he was there. He wasn't really earning much money, as mentioned. He was kind of, you know, a small amount of money when he was there. Um, getting on well with his family. When he mentioned there, he's working really hard. He's scrubbing the floors. There's a lot of people who are kind of coming out of prison and things like that who are living there. Many people treat it in a kind of a bad way. Um, you know, they don't treat it with the respect it deserves. And he gets quite angry about that. He's like, he's like, you know you're not going to scrub the floors fine i will scrub the floors so he does that he mans the phones when he's there he's um 
uh, because he's scrubbing the floors, his his jeans that he's wearing are actually becoming quite tatty. So he mentions it, and even though his sister, the one who's going blind, is is you know she's struggling to hold down a job and she doesn't have much money she sends him a new pair of jeans so this becomes kind of a big thing for him she's also the one his his uh sister she's the, the one he likes uh she's also the one that uh, sends him a guitar as well so he starts playing guitar again uh, and his other hobby which is one of the questions which we uh which we won't go into i've entirely lost the page i was on uh yeah that was, a, that was a big mistake, Michael. You've just moved pages now. I uh, don't know where you seem to be. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't think I'll, I'll go into more because we've still got next. Year. Oh, let's do the, let's do this letter. So this was the whole. This was the full letter to his mum, who interestingly he he, so he calls mum, but he also calls her Fran as well. You can see there's a bit of a, a, a disconnect there. Uh, Dear mum, I must apologise for not writing to you before now. Must be a couple of weeks since our chat on the phone. Everything here is fine. Same with me, except for one thing, which I wonder if you can help me with. There was this girl called Anne. We don't know who Anne is, who I'm very fond of uh, and who has sort of kept an eye on me for about four years now. Anyhow, last week she had an accident and as a result she is in hospital but up in Nottingham. Uh, she wants me to see her, yet when I told her on the phone I would hitch up straight away, she tells me not to, just in case you bring a car with you. Um, I think I think as in bring someone else with you. Uh, I, I tried to explain that that was unlikely uh, that I would nowadays. Oh, sorry. Uh, in case in case he brings a car with him, meaning a, a car that he's stolen. Sorry, that's what that's what she means. Uh, but she says, no, not unless I can get someone to give me a lift from Ramsgate, which is ridiculous besides being impossible. I want very much to see her. Yet if I did hitch up there and she asked how I got there, uh, I couldn't lie to her as we agreed never to lie to each other. And funnily enough, I never have. Uh, so what to do? Do you think you can spare me a few of those ackers? Um, I, I've rephrased that as pounds in the episode because i knew people would go what's an acker and as as i did that seems to be their thing uh i hate to ask but she really is the only girl i've ever felt anything for and i don't like the idea of her up there being alone for a month or so i've highlighted that, that i think that's really interesting that he doesn't like the idea of her being alone this will come back later on uh her parents live in surrey and she hasn't seen them for some time i doubt very much uh if they'll bother to go up and see her uh, had a call from Liz the other day who phoned me, didn't say much about her eyes. Poor kid. Seems very anxious to know what work she will be able to do. Only hope she doesn't worry too much. Uh, did you tell her about my jeans? She mentioned them uh, and lo and behold, a few days later, a pair of jeans arrive. I did not... Uh, I did tell her not to bother, especially with her being out of work, but she seemed to want to buy me something, and I must say they came in very handy. They did, because these are the jeans, jeans that he would wear when uh, he, he murdered Sarah. Uh, well, it's very late, and I'm on the phone duty tonight. Uh, it means sleeping in the office, and the only trouble is that I can't get any sleep, as we have a terrifyingly noisy clock which chimes out the hours, and once I'm exhausted, I can't but get back to sleep. So it seems I get an hour's kip and then about five hours guitar practice. So cheers for now. I'm sorry that I ask you for things all the time, but she really does mean a lot to me. Maybe you'll meet her sometime. Love to you all. Take care, Dave, with a little kiss. It's just nice. I like those letters. They give you a, I, I, it give you a better insight into who a person is. Uh, so right, let's do some of the answers to the questions, and I, I can, I'm going to have a swig of uh, quaffy all right instant coffee unfortunately a little while ago because i do the, the the coffee roulette i put in one of these beanie ones a, a flavored one and it's just it's wet and it's horrible and it's just ugh, it's just ruined all the all the other coffees polluted it yeah so never gonna buy that one again sorry beanies or whatever you call but coffee was just ugh, it wasn't i didn't enjoy it um okay question one what were david froome's middle names they were Charles and Richard. Question two. Which part of West London was he born? 
uh, technically two parts. So uh, Perivale and Greenford. It was Perivale Maternity Hospital in Greenford. So uh, uh, question three. Name his two stepsisters. They were Leslie and Liz. Question four. What was the name of the dog he adopted at Simonwell? It was Rascal. Question five. How much money did the two sex workers fleece from him in total? Was £39. Pounds. Question six. How many rooms at the Simon Well how many rooms were at the Simon Well Trust? Um four hundred. I, I think I might have ruined that in the uh the bit that we just did. That's fine. Question seven Name one of the songs he learned to play on the guitar. It was On Top of Old Smokey and Tom Dooley. Question eight. Outside of playing guitar, what was his other hobby? It was writing poetry. And in brackets, uh, I didn't put this in the episode, he wrote modern. I like that bit. Uh, question nine. Name one of the four famous sites, as mentioned in the episode, which circles St. James's Park. They were Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, uh, Horse Guards Parade, uh, 10 Downing Street and St. James's Palace. And question 10, who was the pathologist who performed Sarah's autopsy? It was Professor Keith Simpson. I always struggle to say that. Professor Keith Simpson. Not the easiest same name to say. Right, I've done a lot on that. I'm going to shut up my gob. So that's me done. Uh, the final uh, part of this three-parter finishes next week. That wasn't even English. I apologise about that. Uh, uh, and then we'll go back to some... Uh, across this series, we've got some uh, single-parters. We've got some double-parters. Lots of episodes which are really fascinating. Uh, what I've done this season is covered cases that... I've just never been covered before. There's too many podcasts out there where people go, I know, episode one, Ted Bundy. And you just go, why? Why are you doing this? This, it's it, All these cases have been covered so many times before. And I, I think to myself also, if it's in a newspaper or someone's written a book about it, why cover it? I think Murder Mile's job from now on is to really focus on the cases that have never been told before. Something entirely different. Uh, and hopefully that's why you come to Murder Mile. So that's me done. Time to uh, have a coffee. Uh, have, uh, I haven't got any cake left and I'm going to start editing this. Have yourself a good week. Stay safe and be good. And now, Michael, time for the long silence. <laughs>